Chapter 3. Bad Disguises Chapter opens with a shot of Arid, Max and the ground crew walking through the forested hilltops of the dry jungle. Machine Gun Guy is walking far before all others, Oliver following right after him. Rifle Guy is uh, talking with a woman a bit further in the back, and at the very end Max and Arid can be seen partly out of frame. It looks towards Max with a desperate smile as he contemplates his recent actions. Max looks straight at him and shrugs. The next panel pans out to show Arid carrying the unconscious girl on his back. After a bit of walking, the group reaches Crystal. They are all greeted by a wide stretching but short plastered brick wall, with watchtowers erected every few hundred meters. Despite the grim message these dense outside fortifications give, the main road leading into the town is busy with people passing through the wide open main gates. Max and Arid enter with the rest of the ground crew and look down at the long packed dirt street which is surrounded by tall housing, of which a lot is made out of wood or even whole logs. Arid and Max stop when the rest of the ground crew does so too. Oliver walks back towards them. He asks them why exactly they needed to get to the crystal. Neither Max nor Eric responds, so Oliver goes up to Max and grabs his inverted uniform's low end, which has folded itself over a bit earlier, revealing a few of the five strips that all surface flight suits have painted on them. Oliver tells him he forgot to fix his uniform and straightens the end out. He explains it was pretty obvious they weren't from here either way. Eric and Max are still silent and fairly terrified since they were sure their obvious disguise was still good enough to trick this crew. Oliver tells the two he'll leave them to look for jobs if that's what they want since he and the crew need to get to the port and leave in an hour. Machine Gun Guy asks Oliver whether Max and Eric would be valid candidates for the squadron they're joining, and he says they might be, but they'd have to apply and see. The woman turns to say that judging by what she heard of the squadron leader, she'd probably look past everything as soon as she heard that they are trained surface pilots. Machine Gun Guy asks the two if they are good surface pilots, but Oliver answers in their place, saying that there are no good surface pilots in the downfall, since if they are good, they don't get shot down. MG Guy remembers something he was wondering about, and excitedly asks the two if they caused the light show from two days ago. Erd carefully asks if by light show they mean the Heliodyne, and eventually he does a shallow nod. Most of the ground crew is fairly surprised, and Erd says he thought they'd be more angry since it was one of their ships that was shot down. Oscar says it wasn't their ship, and that they didn't even know it was a ship since not many people are dumb enough to try and escape with those, especially from so far inland. Oliver sighs at the whole conversation and tells everyone these two might be twisting the truth right before Max interrupts him. He double checks if he and Aird really can apply to join the squadron, and Oliver says they can try, but they need to get to the squadron tracture first. Max is pretty confused and asks what a tracture is, so Rifle Guy just tells him it's a big, usually fairly empty airfield that can be quickly made operational if needed. Max says it's like one of those back from the war and Rifle Guy nods. Erd asks how they are going to get there and Rifle Guy explains they have bought seats on a mailing airskiff beforehand and that the skipper will drop them off at the tracture. Realizing they might not know what an airskiff is, he explains it is just a small air marine. Erd asks if there is any space for them and Oliver tries to deter them by saying there likely isn't any but still tells them to come along with him after feeling bad for him and Max. A staircase leading onto a metal platform from a street passageway is seen. The ground crew walks down the long flight of stairs and stops near the bottom. Max and Derrid stop for a second to look in awe at the huge yet fairly empty skyport. Several large air marines can be seen moored along the heavy docks and metal walkways, some with engines still running, others completely silent. Below the docks, a long drop can be seen reaching hundreds and hundreds of meters down into a sparse fog, leaving the rocky basin below covered in shade. The woman who they still don't know the name of, says she wonders where all the cloud forts were sent off to, as the place feels empty without them. Rifle Guy tells her that the arsenal is setting up a blockade to stop illegal weapon exports to the south. Oliver says the Catalan is still there, pointing to a several hundred meter long metal-plated flying warship that had gone unnoticed on the far east side of the port. Despite the air marines being larger than regular ships due to the vast space the lifting gas takes up in their hull, the Catalan is still larger than any other ship in the port, making it quite an amazing sight. Max and Derrid look in awe at the sheer size of the ships moored along the long catwalk docks. Oliver tells the two he just now realizes they probably never saw an air marine up this close. Erd says that not these kinds most definitely. Machine Gun Guy asks what kinds of air marines the surface has, and Derrid says they're called wireframes, but Machine Gun Guy immediately tells him that he's heard of that and that it's not true. Erd tells him it is and that he literally stood on the flight deck of one, and Max did too. Max quickly nods but soon diverts everyone's attention to a problem at hand nobody had mentioned yet, which is what they'll do about the unconscious girl. Since it is by now pretty obvious they don't know her, the group starts to think. Erd says they just need to find some safe place to leave her, like a hospital. Oliver says that they can stay behind and drag her to one, but they'll be late if they want to bring her all the way out of the port.
Bird asks why not find some place in the port, but Machine Gun Guy assures him he does not want to leave her in the port. Oliver is very impatient and tells her to just carry her on board and that there will be plenty of ships for her to return with at the tracture. The crew walks over to a small suspended catwalk stretching far away from solid ground above the large drop-off the port is built on. From the catwalk, the underside of the port can be seen, full of metal supports and smaller mooring bridges suspended by heavy steel cables. Near its end, the docked airskiff can be seen, a large blimp aircraft that is still fairly small for an air marine, but formidable relative to most other aerial vehicles. Several sailors can be seen moving tied piles of paperwork, cardboard boxes and crates of various sizes off the catwalk and onto the small air marine. The man overlooking the whole operation, presumably the captain, greets Oliver but also Rifle Guy and the woman, calling them Marion and Octa respectively. Machine Gun Guy tells the captain whether he will get a warm hug for the troubles he saved him last time when they met. The captain calls him out by name, calling him Flank and tells him he promises to return the favor when he can. Flank immediately asks him if the favor could be today. The captain is surprised, but not in a good way, and Oliver is visibly displeased too. Flank says that they're a bit heavy, pointing to Max and Aird and the unconscious girl. He asks the captain if he can let them through for free. Oliver wants to intervene, but the captain asks Flank if he will stop bothering him if he carries these three free of charge. Flank just grins and nods. The captain takes a long deep breath and turns around to tell the other sailors to pick up the pace. Oliver tells Flank this kind of stuff is not something you should do to people who help you out regularly, but Flank tells him he should be happy since he just saved him some cash. A few panels show the cargo bay doors on the side of the airskiff closing with everybody lying between boxes, packages and crates that were just carried inside as the mailing ship doesn't actually have proper seats in the cargo bay. Here it is seen lying between some larger hardwood crates with lots of wrapped packages behind him. Then next to him, leaning back against the same package pile, is the unconscious girl, still fast asleep. Aerid looks around and sees everybody trying to sleep. He wants to do the same, but he can't, can't seem to do so. He is clearly thinking about his situation, occasionally glancing at the girl. Despite many turbulent thoughts, Aerid finally feels himself falling asleep. As he tries to shut his eye, the girl next to him calmly wakes up. He doesn't notice at first, but then turns his head around to see her with half-closed eyes, just as, if not more drowsy than him. Aerid's eyes slowly widen from surprise. The girl asks him who he is in a very sharp Scottish accent, and he tells her he's Arid. She asks him for water and Arid reluctantly agrees, reaching out around the crate towards Marion's canteen, which he had lying next to his rifle. He gives her the canteen and she proceeds to drink every last drop of the water before closing it again. Arid takes some time to notice the features he couldn't see under the hood before. Besides the greyish, strangely straight, almost shoulder-length hair and the anti-glare lines of face paint under her eyes, what he finds the most strange is how, though pretty, she looks thin and even somewhat sickly. The girl asks if she will be let go. Erid says she will, but they first have to make landfall. Erid nervously looks around, but everyone else seems to be asleep, including Max. The girl grabs his attention again, asking him what the situation is. Erid whispers to her that he and his friend dragged her out of a forest after she was knocked out. He tries to say the ground crew helped them out, but the girl stops him and tells him she has to get out of here. Erid asks if it's a hurry, but Octave starts waking up as she hears the other two speaking. The girl notices her and nods before looking over, first just glancing but then outright staring in pure shock. Octave points out how the girl is awake, unsure of what her surprised expression is warranted by. The girl tries to say she knows Octave but she tells her she definitely doesn't. Just then, the captain barges into the dark storage room from the cockpit, waking everyone. He says that they need to turn around to pick up some cargo that was not loaded onto the ship by accident. The scene switches to the ship docking back at the port. It is standing next to the open cargo door. The captain and another sailor carry a large weapon crate onto the ship. The girl stands up, holding onto the side of the wooden storage crate, as she still feels slightly dizzy after waking up. Erd gets up to help her, but she just walks forward. She stumbles towards the side door of the air marine and exits, holding onto the railing of the catwalk the ship has docked to again once she's outside. She looks back to the insides of the ship with a fairly confused expression. Erd stands at the door and asks her if she will be fine, and she nods, still looking into the ship, and more specifically at the inverted uniform on his chest. Erd moves away from the door so the captain can push the ship away from the catwalk and close it. He walks back to his spot and sits down again, somewhat glad that he's done with this whole ordeal. Oliver tells him he hopes Erd feels his rescue plan was worth it. Erd sighs and doesn't give him a direct answer, saying that they should all sleep it off. Oliver tells him he's at least damn right about that. Post chapter. The girl silently watches the ship leave from the catwalk dock, and she sighs in relief. She reaches for a leather bag she had hanging off her shoulder below her poncho. She falls to despair after seeing it is empty, as if someone took something out of it that she really needed. 
After calming down a bit, she takes some pieces of paper out of it which turn out to be photographs. In the photos, pictures of various surface flight uniforms are seen laid out on wooden tables, along with the same kinds of flight suits that Max and Derrid wore. On the back of the last photo, the word this is written, along with some strange dots and dashes. The girl checks the photo out intently and starts looking at the details of the flight jacket, looking at the stitches specifically, noticing they match Arid's and Max's uniforms perfectly. With a sudden glint of hope in her eyes, the girl puts the photos back in her bag and looks towards the airskiff in the distance. She looks back at the port and, thinking fast, starts running back to it from the catwalk. A shot shows her stopping before a timetable for ship departures, checking the 1223 departure and asking a nearby woman what that bit of the timetable says. She says that one is leaving for the lake, but it says that the ship stops at the north fracture. Without a thank you, the girl rushes off deeper into the port, running as if her life depended on it.